Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today, I have great pleasure in welcoming Robert Friedland as our keynote speaker. Robert is founder and executive chairman of Ivanhoe Mines. Among his recent successes has been the development of the Kamoa Kakula Copper Mine, which is undergoing a series of phased expansions and would become one of the largest copper mines in the world on completion. But that's not all. He has several other projects currently under development, and he has also been a keen proponent of the green energy transition and the vital role that mining will play in creating a green global economy. Hello, Robert, and welcome to the World Copper Conference. Pleasure to see you so clearly from Singapore, Vanessa. Thank you. So without further ado, uh, I think we should jump straight into the questions. Sure. Robert, you were one of the early voices on the emerging supply demand challenges in the copper market, especially as they pertain to green energy and decarbonization. Please would you update us on where you stand today on the copper market and if your timelines or outlooks have changed in any way. Nothing has really changed uh, as a species. We've mined 700 million metric tons of copper since the dawn of human history at the rate that we're currently mining to maintain 3% GDP growth. We need another 700 million tons in the next 22 to 24 years, absent electrification of the world economy, absent electrification of transportation, absent the reduction of hydrocarbon or coal from our power generation system. 700 million tons of copper means that we're gonna look at a deficit later this decade of at least 5 million tons a year, maybe as much as 9 million tons a year. So we've been talking about electrification for a long time. I think I doubt there's anyone on the planet who's not cognizant of the worries about global warming and say the automobiles industry's response. But now we've had subsequent events in the last two weeks involving the fact that the entire world economy will be balkanized given the warlike environment we suddenly find ourselves in as a result of the tragic invasion of Ukraine. That's going to change everything even more so. So Robert, you've also referred in the past to certain minerals as national security issues, given their importance to technology and clean energy, and that includes copper. Could you briefly outline your thesis on this issue and its relation to the fracturing of global supply chains? It's so blatantly obvious that Copper conducts electrical energy better, better than anything else other than gold or silver, which are too expensive for the purpose. The Germans offered 5,000 helmets to protect 42 million Ukrainians. They've now had a cold bucket of water thrown in their face, and they want to throw 100 billion euros as a down payment on remilitarizing Germany. How much metal do you think that's going to take? How much metal it's going to take for the Dutch, for example, or the Belgians to increase their defense spending to 2% of GDP on top of electrification of the world economy. So as you know, the Germans are addicted to Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2. If you want to get off of that Russian gas addiction and generate solar power or wind power or nuclear power, how much copper is that going to take over and above generating 3% GDP growth. We face a crisis for copper and many other critical raw materials. And now as a result of the warlike environment we find ourselves in also for food. And to grow more food, you need more energy. And to grow more energy, you need more copper. So there's just no avoiding the fact that any thinking reasonable person who looks at the world economy recognizes we simply cannot continue to exist as a species with a lot more copper, especially if we want to reduce hydrocarbon consumption or if we want to electrify the world transportation fleet. So moving on then to talk about uh, decarbonization, it seems as if power grids and systems are often overlooked. Please, would you discuss this issue for governments uh, and the potential impact on the copper market? 
Power grids and systems are a joke. If you look at the American electrical grid, I've been quoted a hundred times as saying it's like a little old lady laying in bed waiting to die. That paradise fire in California that killed all those people recently, that power line was 106 years old in California. So the American electrical grid simply cannot tolerate your kind self and myself coming home at 5 p.m. and plugging in an electrical car. If we all plug in an electrical car in the American grid, when we come home from work, the grid is kaput. We had the whole Texas grid go down. Everybody was freezing in the dark in Texas due to just a little cold wave. So the American electrical grid is a hodgepodge of poorly maintained ancient systems. It is not a modern electrical grid as the Chinese are constructing. It's a very old, very tired piece of junk. It will take tens of trillions of dollars just to stabilize the grid and decarbonize it and make it smarter so that you can absorb solar and wind. It'll take trillions, tens of trillions. The solar takes copper, the wind takes copper, the modernization of the grid takes copper. And by the way, the aluminum price is an all time high. So don't worry about substitution from aluminum. Aluminum is making a new high as we speak. After all, aluminum is just electrical energy in solid form. Look at the energy shortage in Europe right now. The Europeans are freezing in the dark. Metal smelters in Scandinavia had to close because electricity was too expensive. What's really happened is too much money went into broadband and internet and the cloud, sexy new technologies, and not enough money went into the basic economy. Not even close. And so, you know, there's a lot of blah, 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 gold ounces that will never manifest. And there's a lot of so-called copper mines that aren't getting built because it's a very long gestation period to actually build a mine, generate uh, confidence from local people and, and governments to create the stability to build a mine. And as you know, it just doesn't happen overnight. So the industry has an enormous amount of work to do to find a responsible way to produce the copper metal we need if we're to even dream of having an energy transition, let alone the sudden requirements for national security. So on the theme of, of decarbonization, uh, could I ask you what steps Ivanhoe is taking to ensure Kamoa will be carbon neutral across the entire supply chain? So meaning, you know, from concentrate through to cathode. We've been drinking this Kool-Aid about uh, changing the world for 30, 40 years. We've been looking at the world for a long time and wondering how we are going to get where we need to get to from here. So um, I, I commonly tell the story that um, if I was sent from Mars by my masters in a flying saucer made of green cheese to this particular little planet hurtling through space, and my master said, find that element in the periodic table called copper, any intelligent person would go to the Democratic Republic of the Congo. It was the largest producer of copper metal on the planet for hundreds of years until the porphyry coppers in Chile were invented. It has hydroelectricity and it has water, something you have lacking in Chile, for example. And you know, I explained this to the CRU Copper Convention 10 or 15 years ago very clearly. And I think they thought I was kidding when I said there's an ocean of 3% cutoff copper in the Congo coming to be produced. So it shouldn't surprise anybody that the world's fastest growing copper domain will be in the Congo. And we thought about this, well, we started in 1995. We, uh, it was a, there was a civil war that ended in 1996 and we went there and started acquiring tenements to explore because we knew the water was there. The Congo River is after all, the second largest source of fresh water in the world after the Amazon. We knew there was hydroelectricity and we knew there was high grade. So if you're in the aluminum business, you want high quality bauxite and you want hydropower, then you win. 
you know, Rio Tinto is a kitty bat, for example, hydroelectricity and high quality bauxite. It's the same in copper. If you have the highest grade and cheap electrical energy, those factors enable you to be the greenest producer. So this is something we've been thinking about for decades. And we've been talking about it very openly. It's only recently people are realizing that it's not viable to grind larger and larger volumes of lower and lower grade rock down to talcum powder, consuming more and more electrical energy per unit of copper. Like how's that electrical energy generated? A lot of it is coal in the Chilean grid, for example, just not viable. And when you actually do a cradle to grave analysis, when you actually do a sperm to germ analysis, when you actually do a womb to tomb analysis and look at the total generation of global warming gas, the best place in the world to be mining is high grade with hydroelectricity in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. We're not climbing way up in the Andes. We're not putting tailings dams in a high seismic zone, huge tailings dams when you know we're, we're milling 10 times the grade of a traditional porphyry. So if my mine is 10 times the grade of your mine, I'm using a 10th of the steel, a 10th of the electrical energy, a 10th of the concrete, a 10th of the water, and what we've seen in the last hundred years is that the water intensity in the copper industry per unit of copper in the last hundred years is up 16 fold. And the energy intensity to produce copper is up 16 fold as we mill lower and lower grade ores. So in short, uh, we see the end of the milling of these lower grade ores, absent a, a technological step change. And by the way, we're working on new technology, enable us to grind lower grade ores with a lot less energy. The, the way we've been milling ore for the last 500 years, you know, bashing rock against rock has to be reinvented and that will be part of the reinvention of mining. We're hard at it, but at the moment, nothing beats high grade, nothing beats continuity, nothing beats the ability to mechanize, nothing beats a, a, an environment where there's no ice or snow. Where we are in the Congo, we're at 3000 feet elevation, It's flat. We're not climbing mountains. It never snows. It hardly rains. There, uh, the the uh, median age in the Democratic Republic of the Congo is 18.7 years of age. 90 million people, mostly very young people, eager to learn, eager to benefit their country, eager to work. They know that they're privileged to be trained in work. And so we have an extremely attractive, bright, young labor force. And this should serve as a wake up call to the rest of the mining industry that although Ivano Mines is a wild success overnight, it took 27 years of hard effort to get to where we are having this conversation right now. Oh, it's interesting. And and more recently, given that you're selling concentrate into China, how did you deal with the difficulty of moving copper out of Africa due to limited container availability? Well, you know, it's undoubtedly posed a challenge uh, on logistics. You know, our cash cost last quarter was a dollar and 28 cents a pound C1 delivered all the way to China. Uh, that's from the mine all the way to China, to the port. So about 37 cents of that $1.28 a pound was logistics cost to move that material from the mine all the way to the Chinese port. And you know that worldwide shipping costs have gone crazy for everybody. It's not limited to Africa. That, uh, you remember all the shipping trying to get into Los Angeles, hundreds of ships. So, um, you know, we've, it's posed a challenge, but we see that coming down. Uh, you can move the material, it just takes a little bit longer. Uh, and from, from the point of our mine, we're paid as soon as the copper leaves the mine gate. We're not involved in those logistics, our buyers are handling logistics. So we are paid right at the mine gate. Our job is to mine the copper and load it on the trucks. Uh, we do see the situation easing over, over the next few years as market dynamics take hold. 
Uh, first of all, we're looking at a much shorter route to the sea through Angola. It's about a third of the distance. And that new Angolan railroad is gonna move us much closer to the ocean. And we're only starting in our, our drive for operational efficiency in logistics. Uh, we're working with our partners, Siddiq and Zijin, to bring down the cost of transportation. And we, are, we see a lot of other shipping alternatives to using containers. You don't necessarily need to use a container to move 55% copper concentrate. But more importantly, um, we're gonna be building a, a direct to blister smelter designed by our friends in Finland from Autokumpu. It'll be a state-of-the-art smelter and it will be profitable in its own right because a smelter will reduce our cash costs another 20 to 30 cents a pound. That'll get us under a dollar a pound delivered to China. And the reason for that is um, apart from the logistics, you're only moving half the volume when you're shipping 99.5% copper. So the shipping cost is basically cut in half. We'll pay less uh, tax to the Congolese government because they encourage downstream beneficiation in their tax rules. And we will generate enormous revenue from sulfuric acid. Uh, we'll be producing about 400,000 metric tons of sulfuric acid per year. Current landed acid prices in Kolwezi in the Congo are around 350 US dollars a ton. That's $150 million a year in sulfuric acid. There's a huge demand for sulfuric acid in the Congo for the oxide copper operators that have SXEW plants. So operations like uh, KCC and Mutanda and Tenge Fukurumi all consume huge amounts of sulfuric acid. So the revenues and cost savings from a smelter vastly outweigh the operating cost of the smelter. And the smelter itself runs on hydroelectric power. So it's the greenest alternative because a lot of the landed global warming gas is just the transportation, moving the copper to the end users. So by shipping 99.5% copper instead of 55% um, copper, you can see that there's a dramatic reduction again in both cost and global warming gas per unit of copper produced. So Robert, uh, you've also recently discussed reinventing mining in terms of an approach to the business. Could you provide some insight into the Ivanhoe approach and what makes it different? Well, first you have to think about what are you doing and why are you doing it? So, you know, we think, uh, we think copper is the new oil. We think copper is fundamental to the world economy. We've been talking to Daniel Jurgen, the Pulitzer Prize winning author of the prize. It's the definitive history of the oil and gas industry. And Daniel is uh, fascinated with the fact that copper is the new oil. Anything you want to do to get away from burning coal, anything you want to do to get away from burning hydrocarbon leads you directly to copper. There is no alternative. So this is not a thought that has occurred to us recently. We've been preaching this publicly for decades. So we want to be carbon neutral across the entire supply chain from copper concentrate right through to cathode. So first of all, we, we went looking for copper where we could develop hydroelectricity. Basic, the Congo River is the deepest, most steepest, second largest source of water in the world. I think the watershed of the Congo River is around 14% of the total area of the African continent. Roughly the scale of Europe, the watershed of the Congo River. And so um, because we have hydroelectricity, we're already one of the lowest cost emitters in the, in the copper industry on a scope one and scope two basis. We probably the very lowest emitter of carbon dioxide per unit of copper produced. And as we uh, replace the diesel equipment underground, they're mining five or 6% copper uh, with battery electric equipment, then we can use solar to charge that, that battery electric equipment and the hydropower we have. So um, as the technology becomes available at the scale we require, uh, Svidala, for example, and the, the other Scandinavian manufacturers are upsizing this battery electric equipment 
we'll have a further reduction in our global warming gas emissions. And then running a hydro-powered high-tech smelter instead of sending material to a coal-fired smelter in Asia vastly reduces our emissions on a scope three basis because a lot of producers in Chile are shipping a 28% low grade concentrate all the way to Asia. And then it goes into a coal burning smelter. So there's a huge amount of global warming gas moving that low grade concentrate. And then it goes into a coal burning smelter, scope three, very bad. So as we move to anode and cathode production, it halves the number of trucks, uh, it reduces the number of ships that are moving. Uh, and so it just gets greener and greener as we go forward. And we will remain the lowest carbon dioxide producer of copper metal in the world. And we will attract, for that reason, a significant premium for our copper over dirtier copper, because we're entering into a world where copper will no longer trade as a fungible commodity. You won't be able to just say, oh, today copper is $4.63 a pound. No. The dirty producers are going to get a discount and the clean producers are going to get a premium. It's already started in the aluminum industry and we're 100% certain it's happening in all base metals, copper included. That's why uh, we've been involved in ABEX technologies here in the Singapore government to make a fungible market based on ESG characteristics for all metals. You know, uh, iron ore used to be traded annually in a negotiation between BHP, Rio Tinto, and the Japanese steel mills. Once a year, every year, they'd have a baby and they come up with a yearly price of iron ore. Then here in Singapore, we came up with a listed iron ore contract. And here you go, most of the world's iron ore is traded here in Singapore on the Singapore Commodity Exchange. The same thing is going to happen with this commodity and all other commodities. If you can produce, uh, copper with low global warming gas, you're going to get a premium. Another way to put it is just to say, the minute you have a tax on carbon, whoever produces the most carbon pays the biggest penalty. Whoever produces the, the, the copper at the, with the least amount of um, carbon dioxide will pay less of a penalty. Same thing as a premium. So the world is changing very fast. We talked to the automobile manufacturers. I was in Germany recently speaking to one of the super giants. And their procurement people are super keen to understand how all of the elements to build a German car come in with as little global warming gas as possible. So these handphones make everything, you know, every one of these handphones is an NGO. Click, and you're on the cover of the New York Times. You can't hide anymore. You know, you're mining 0.3 of 1% copper and burning coal to chew up all that electrical energy. How much global warming gas are you producing per kilogram of copper? So look at the chart. The Congolese copper is the cleanest copper being produced globally because of grade and hydropower. And you know, a, a lot of people in the industry are like a rat in a big mayonnaise jar running around in circles, trying to get out of the jar. What I've told you is so obvious, there's no escape. There's just no escape. Facts are facts. The truth is the truth. Kamoka Kula is the cleanest, most consciously designed copper mine in the world. And it will remain in that position. And you know, we're starting up the second mill as we speak, it's going into hot commissioning by the time this airs, we'll probably be producing uh, concentrate from the second unit. Um, and so we're talking about, you know, 19,000 times two, say 37, 38,000 tons per month of super green copper opening soon at a theater near you by the time this airs. And it only grows from there. So um, there's nothing like it. And it deserves to be talked about because we have, I don't know, 14,000 people, uh, close to 12,000 of them working on making this a reality. And it was a very long, difficult trek for the last 26 years. Hard work to be an overnight success in the copper mining industry. And that's the tragedy of our industry is copper could go to $10 a pound 
It could go to $20,000 a ton. You won't get a quick overnight increase in copper production because of the nature of our industry. It's a very long-term, very difficult, even miserable enterprise to be involved in. And then if you want to really do it consciously, you really have to think decades ahead, very long-term. So to, just on Kamur Kukula, um, obviously it has emerged as one of the, the greatest recent success stories in the copper industry. I mean, what, what key factors would you identify then in terms of, of being successful? What would have been the, um, you know, the two most important things would you say in terms of mine development and, and making it so successful? Well, it's not one of the most successful, it is the most successful period, full stop. It's the highest grade major copper mine in the world and the only one running on hydropower with a low global warming gas footprint. And I'd say one of the, there are a number of critical things we should talk about. First of all, um, we've understood the incredible power that comes from the employment of women in senior capacities in mining. Women are sort of out of the box thinkers Maybe in our evolution, they, they used to look after their children. We think women make better miners than men. When we train both men and women to operate sophisticated underground mining equipment, uh, we see that the women evidence a greater sense of responsibility and sensitivity to the machinery. And so we think the training of young women is, it, it doesn't double our productivity, it nearly triples it. It keeps the men on their toes that women can do a better job than the men. And you know, in a lot of Africa, you know, a lot of the men would be more likely to drink alcohol and be irresponsible. The women uh, in, in African society are, are an enormously important resource. So you may know the president of our company is a woman, but we, you know, we have women in the most senior of capacities, including underground. In our training academies for underground mining, I'm happy to tell you that as of today, 54% of the trainees are women. So I, I think that's really something that we've uh, discovered to be profoundly true. Secondly, uh, we have to pay due credit to our excellent supportive Chinese partners because our Chinese partners had the, uh, the ability to make sure that we had the benefits of the Chinese supply chain during the COVID crisis. We were able to build uh, productive capacity ahead of schedule and under budget and nobody else in the mining industry has built a tier one mine ahead of schedule and under budget. We're the only one. And that happened from the support of our Chinese partners because when it came to getting steel or fabricated equipment, because China is the world's buyer for about half of the world's copper, the world's largest buyer, because it's obviously in the Chinese government and Chinese people's interest to have that copper developed we had enormous support from Zijin Mining and from Citic, our Chinese partners. So I'd say that was another very important factor. And then thirdly, we've seen an enormous improvement in governance and transparency with the new government in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, led by President Felix Chisikedi and his prime minister, Prime Minister Sama. We're seeing a lot more stability in the government we're seeing much better governance. And by the way, in the Congolese government, our local governor in Lululaba province is a woman. Uh, the minister of mines is a woman. So we're seeing women in a position of power in the Congo. And I think they're more concerned with the elimination of corruption. So we, uh, we take our hats off to the very significant improvements that the Congolese government has engendered because I've been in the Congo since 1995. We've seen civil war, we've seen strife, and we've seen the evolution of, you know, petite mall and grand mall corruption in, in previous years. But there's been a remarkable improvement in the governance position in the Congo. And uh, really, there's just been an enormous improvement. Uh, if you fly to Kolwezi today, you're gonna land in a brand new international airport and you'll see towers up there, cell towers. Those are 5G cell phone towers. You'll drive on a brand new highway to our mine and the food is as good as a restaurant you'd find in Paris. 
all of it's organic. You know, our people are fish farming and they're growing vegetables and they're raising chickens. And so all of the software around the mine, all of the human development factors are better than we've ever seen. Because if we have a mine with very broad shoulders and there's a big fat delta between the cutoff grade and the head grade, if the mine can generate a lot of cash flow, then we can afford to uplift the human population around the mine. If, you, if you've got a mine that's just sort of hanging on by its fingertips, barely existing, just doing a little bit better than breaking even, then you can't afford to do anything for your neighbors. So uh, a very strong mine and a very long-lived mine can invest in the local population. And you know we've got 1.5 billion tons of extremely high-grade ore. Uh, we're currently going to push this to 9 million tons a year. It'll take us 158 years to mine it. So we're going to go to 20 million tons a year. It's still 75 years of mining without a new discovery. There'll be many more discoveries. And so we have a sort of limitless resource. We have limitless free electrical energy. There's nothing but sunshine there, plenty of room for solar and a very young population that's very happy to uplift themselves. You know, I like to compare it to what um, a small American company did in Saudi Arabia in the 1930s. What was Saudi Arabia like in the 1930s? when a small uh, American company went to go look for oil in Saudi Arabia, they had nothing. They had some camels, some goats, some sheep, and you know, Bedouin people living a tough existence under a very hot sun without much water, going from oasis to oasis. It was a crazy thing to go looking for oil in 1938, you know, in the desert. And when they found the Guar field, that small American junior company. Well, today that's called Aramco. It's the world's largest corporation. And we're completely dependent on our Saudi brothers and sisters for maintaining our energy security. Look at Europe. It's freezing in the dark this winter and completely dependent on uh, buying hydrocarbon from someone in Russia who's bombing women and children today. Bombing will women and children under the full guise of the world media. So um, I think, you know, the whole ESG thing is important, but preventing outright crimes against a young and a vulnerable population is even more important. And that means that Europe is gonna to have to get off of the Russian hydrocarbon addiction. And that means Europe's gonna to have to build nuclear power plants and solar and wind in massive scale and again, that will require our copper. So our industry has an enormously important role to play in developing a better world. And everybody at the CRU convention should really be proud of the fact that copper mining is distinctly a part of the solution and not part of the problem. Now, a lot of people do a lot of whinging and a lot of moaning about the state of the world but somebody has to roll up their sleeves and go out there and find the copper and then engineer it and design it and build it consciously. And so I'm here to tell you that it's not just me, the person that's talking to you. We have thousands of dedicated people that have worked on this effort the last 25 years. And so, it, you know, it really, it's like, it's like creating a new culture like yogurt, you know, or yeast to make your bread. We've developed a different culture and you can see it on our website. You can see it in our ESG audit. We are completely different than the traditional incumbents that inherited you know, their grandfather's patrimony in their ore bodies. You know, it was, it was the Guggenheims that went into Chile around the turn of the century. I think it was around 1906. They took their equipment from the Panama Canal and started digging at Chuki Kamada. That was more than 100 years ago. Kidelco is mining copper that was taken away from Anaconda and Kennecott. It was nationalized by Mr. Allende. The Americans got that started 100 years ago. So, you know, it's an old, tired legacy. And the Gini coefficient is awfully high in Chile. A lot of young people in Chile would like to see a lot more social justice in Chile. 
And so I, I think the mining industry has to be completely redesigned from first principles. And first, somebody has to prove that it can be done differently. And that's why so many people are running uh, our, um, our company that are of the female gender, because women are better than men at mining. Surprise, big surprise, but it's a fact. Well, it's very good to hear your comments about women, Robert, I have to say. Well, but talking yeah. about bringing more copper supply to the market, I uh, understand Ivanhoe is also exploring its massive Western Foreland copper project next door to Kamoa Kapula. Uh, could you discuss what makes the prospect so exciting in terms of the copper basin story? Yeah, you know, there's different types of copper mines. People need to understand the, the porphyry coppers, which are mined in Arizona and they're mined in Chile and in Peru, and a few have been discovered in Ecuador and in Colombia. They're like giant loaves of bread, you know, they're as big as cities. They take several billion dollars to go into production. So they're like building a nuclear power plant. Oyatolgoy is eight years late, 10 years late. That's a porphyry copper in Mongolia. Uh, Corvada Blanca, Cuevaco, these things are really late and they have huge cost overruns just because they're so big. Five, six, seven billion dollars to build a mine. Las Bambas in Peru, eight, nine, ten billion dollars. So the bigger the capital cost, the more likely it's to be like a, a, cast, a cost overrun in building a nuclear power plant. There's just too much stuff required, too much steel, too, too much work, you know, too much water, too much electricity. And so um, these sedimentary deposits are radically different. They're much higher grade, they're mechanizable, and they have a very tiny environmental footprint, tiny little tailings dam, tiny water consumption, tiny energy consumption. So the, the, the most valuable mineral resource in the history of this planet is the Gwar oil field in Saudi Arabia. It's in a sedimentary basin. The sedimentary basin has hydrocarbon. And that's what's built the modern nation of Saudi Arabia and has literally powered the world with that energy to build the world we live in today, like London, New York, you know? That was all Saudi energy since the 1930s. Now, the copper in the Western Forelands is in the same geology as Gwar. It's in a sedimentary basin. It's like oil field geology. So when you have a major oil and gas basin, you have these sort of randomly distributed deposits within a plane, within you know, certain pages in the book. And uh, the Congo has an enormous sedimentary basin that had uh, basin-wide events that distribute copper over enormous areas. And so we think that there's huge amounts more copper to be discovered with modern exploration technology. And we're opening up the roads and the bridges and the fundamental infrastructure to do that work. Uh, one uh, Kamoa system can produce say a million tons of copper a year. Three of them would be 3 million tons of copper a year. There's no reason why many more can't be found. And so uh, taking all of our proprietary knowledge we're expanding our exploration effort. And we're working under the aegis of the new Congolese mining law. We're very happy with the new rules. We're very supportive of the efforts of the government. And I'm happy to tell you that investors from all over the world are coming to the Congo. I'm talking about investors from the Middle East, investors from Europe, sovereign wealth funds, major mining companies wishing they were there. Uh, Barrick is the second biggest gold company in the world. Uh, Mark Bristow, the CEO of Barrick, is probably the best single CEO in the industry. He knows exactly what he's doing. Uh, Barrick bet the farm on gold mining in the Congo. It's the biggest investment Barrick ever made. It was the Kibali gold mine, which is a spectacular gold asset that will run for many decades in the Congo. So there's really nothing strange about it. It's just that it took a while to stabilize. And actually Chile's had a much worse history of nationalization and disruption. And so there's no, there's no place that's perfectly safe for mining unless you win the uh, confidence and the buy-in of local people. You have to work 
with local people and they have to see that mining as a good. Now we're working in, we've worked in 60 countries. We're working in Latin America. Uh, Ivano Electric, one of our companies is doing an IPO very soon. Uh, that'll be opening soon in a theater near you. And one of the countries we're very interested in is the United States of America. We think the United States of America is very underexplored. There are states where you are allowed to mine. 10% of the copper ever mined in the world came from Arizona. Freeport has been spectacularly successful in Arizona over many decades. And uh, Utah has a great mining history. Uh, the Bigham Canyon mine is the world's largest single producer of copper in human history. That's Rio Tinto's mine near Salt Lake City. Montana produced a huge amount of copper. The Butte mine in Montana made William Randolph Hearst one of the richest Americans. Uh, and so there are places in America where there's an enormous potential resource endowment, but you have to look for areas where you can mine with a minimal environmental impact, where you can mitigate environmental impact, and again, start mining with a clean sheet of paper. Most of that mining is likely to be underground. It's unlikely to be open pit mining. It's likely to be very high grade, and it's likely to be designed consciously with a new generation of tailings ponds, for example, where it would just be impossible to have a tailings dam disaster. We're mining in um, the Platte Reef in South Africa. There's nickel and copper there, and we're using dry stack tailings. In the Congo, we're putting about 55 to 60% of our tailings back underground. They go back in the underground workings. So our tailings dams are tiny, 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 maybe 5% of the size of a Chilean porphyry copper. And so I, I think, you know, we're working towards an answer where our footprints in the sand will show the industry a better and more conscious way to mine. And again, I'm telling you, uh, our Chinese uh, shareholders have been very supportive and the women in our organization are leading this visionary charge to finally bring the mining industry kicking and screaming into the modern world. Well, I think we're running out of time now. So I'd just like to thank you very much, Robert, for joining us today. Uh, it's been fascinating getting your insights and perspectives on all the important topics facing the copper market today. Uh, so thank you very much indeed for your time. Hats off to all the miners in Santiago de Chile. Get out there and produce the copper the world needs. Uh, and uh, that way we'll leave behind a better world. And let's hope that the Chilianos find a better way to make mining more sustainable uh, to contribute to the world economy. We're not competing. We're all gonna have to work hard to find the copper that this world needs and for our kids and for our grandkids. So all the best from Singapore. Thank you so much, Vanessa. Thank you, Robert, and goodbye.